Okay. Well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, Steve Johnson, uh, former deputy, now insurance consultant to the industry. And uh, my area is uh, the section D of the template. And again, remember the template is a guide, uh, but I think, you know, when, when kind of you requested a template, it does create kind of the minimum standard. I do believe you're gonna to have to make sure you answer each and every question. You can expand beyond the template. And in many cases you should consider, if your story is a good story, you should consider going beyond the template uh, to show your, the quality of your corporate governance. If you truly believe you have great corporate governance. Uh, so remember that the template is just the minimum questions that you need to give the information to the department. Uh, so it has its drawbacks because now you created the floor. Um, but I will say for smaller companies, I do think the template made sense, but it does create the floor. I think Steve, if I could add, I mean, the comment about the best practices and sitting in the litigation where, you know, the gentleman from the, the universe, Kennesaw University came with the, the book that he wrote, again, it was very onerous and it was like, there's just no way a small insurer in, in the state of Florida could comply with all of this. So again, you're using it as a guide and again, that it's your, your answers that you're supposed to be putting in. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about section D, uh, corporate governance uh, disclosure practices for directing senior management, which is obviously a critical responsibility of a board, amongst many responsibilities of a board. I always think it's good to know and understand some of the rationale, the thinking of regulators when the CGAD was drawn up, especially in this area. And since I was involved with crafting the model law and the model regulation, uh, I have some, you know, I know some of the thought process that went into the CGAD, especially in this area. And that is when talking about directing senior management and understanding and giving an understanding to the regulator how the board does that, it's, it, the first point is simple. Everybody needs a boss and everybody needs to be overseen. And how does the board do that with senior management? Because that's who's responsible for overseeing um, the senior management is the board. So it just makes sense. Everybody needs a boss. How does that boss operate in his oversight capacity? Uh, and the regulators need to know how that oversight works. How does the board interact with senior management and determine whether or not senior management is executing on the strategy, culture, and many other things that the board should lay out to senior management to execute. And by the way, oversight is a form of risk mitigation. It's an internal control. If you don't have oversight, guess what happens? Well, we didn't have much oversight in the mortgage area and you know our economy went to hell when you know they were giving away mortgages to people who didn't even have to verify income and you know, given it, anybody could get a mortgage if you remember back in 2005 and six, seven, it was great for people to try to buy a home, but when the whole thing cratered because it wasn't based on any good solid economics um, and credit worthiness and the whole thing fell apart, it almost brought down the whole economy. Again, where was the oversight? Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is a great quote about oversight and just this whole CGAD. And it came from an article in AM Best from a former uh, superintendent in New York who's a friend of mine, Howard Mills, in an article. And when he was talking about CGAD, he had this quote, need for ongoing deep board involvement in risk oversight. <sighs> I mean, that is critical to what a board's all about and what the oversight especially the oversight of senior management's all about. So these are the things that regulators really need to know and why, and the logic behind answer, asking some of these questions about the actual practices of your company in directing that. So let's look at the, um, 
Let's talk about the questions in the, uh, in the template in directing senior management. The first area is determining appropriate background, experience, and integrity of key persons. Key persons in my, in my thought process is your C-suite. This is directed at the C-suite. The CEO, the COO, the CIO, whatever C-suite you have, chief underwriting officer, et cetera. Um, that's the board's sweet spot on oversight is the C-suite. The main person in that oversight, obviously, is the CEO. That's the direct line, but really it's all the C-suite is the responsibility of the board on oversight. So any oversight starts with the quality of the individual for the position. Um, and you have to have some standards, right? You, you just can't interview a bunch of people without having an understanding of your needs of the organization, the standard, what the job takes, what you're looking for as a board in that position. So the first thing you need to, again, talk to the department about in this process and reporting to the department in the CGAT is, what processes and practices of suitability standards are used to determine if officers and key persons in control functions have the appropriate background, experience, and integrity to fulfill their roles? What standards do you have? Do you use even just a plain job description is a standard, correct? Do you have job descriptions for everybody? You know, a lot of smaller companies just don't. Their, their HR area is probably lax and smaller. As you get, obviously, as you get a bigger, as a company, your HR area can, becomes more important in your documentation. But here, the board needs some kind of standard to go off of. So what is it? What do you have in place? And remember, you don't want to create things that you may do as Joel, I think that maybe Joel was the one who said this, you have to tell them what you're currently doing, but if you're thinking about change, that's not a bad thing to add in, if you're really gonna execute on change. I wouldn't put something in and then three years later, the department said, hey, you were gonna make this change, Where, where's the change? So be careful, again, I think Joel said that, be careful on what you send into the department, because at some point, at a minimum, the financial exam Every word you wrote down is going to be reviewed by that examiner. So again, be honest. Again, there's no rules here, so there's nothing here to say what the minimum is. The department wants to know what you're actually doing in this process. So, and again, as you go through each of these questions, if you really don't think you have quality suitability standards for your C-suite, shouldn't you put that on your agenda as a board? Should you hire an HR firm to assist you in developing standards for your C-suite positions? Do you have the appropriate C-suite positions? All things that you need to consider and answering the question, but also in thinking about the future of your organization. Because, you know, what's the background in these suitability standards? What kind of person are you looking for? What kind of experience? The integrity. Hey, are you doing any kind of background checks on your, your future potential employees? If not, at a minimum, at a minimum, do you at least go in and, and Google the person? Because you may find out stuff that's important in your decision making on whether or not just on a Google search today. To say, I didn't do a background check and I didn't look at Google as a board, when I'm hiring the CFO or the CEO, whew, I wouldn't want to explain that if something goes awry with that person, explain to the department, your lack of due diligence. Because this is about due diligence when you're in your hiring process as a board, especially the CEO. You don't want to trip up. And again, there's vendors out there that it can assist companies in these areas. But background checks of some sort, I think are critical to determine whether or not the person has integrity. Identify the specific positions for which suitability standards have been developed and for each position provide a description of the standards employed. So 
<laughs> the department, by putting that into the template, that almost says, if you don't have standards, oof, I mean, that's low hanging fruit for the department to come back and say, how can you have no standards for each of your C-suite positions? And if you don't, you're gonna, you're gonna have to tell them. And, and if you don't, you better have a work stream in place as a board today to get those standards up. Again, standards of experience, background, suitability, integrity. So if you don't, you got to admit it, mea culpa, don't be afraid to do mea culpas in here if you think you're, you're not strong. But if you do, you better think about, the board better think about work streams to execute on delivering a better standard for meeting that governance provision for the board. Um, have these standards been modified since the last CGED was filed? So one of the things with the CGED, we didn't talk about it much, but after the first year, first of all, your first one is probably the most important one you're gonna do. Because it's gonna set the tone, it's going to be the foundation for every other filing in the future. So your board and your senior management should be carefully putting this response together for the department. Because it is the foundation. Because after this one, what you need to report on are the changes. And, and why those changes occur and, and the continuing explanation in those areas of change. But if you don't have a good foundation, the next one with changes isn't gonna be very good either. So again, your first one is the most critical because future reporting is changes off of that. If so, what procedures are in place to monitor and evaluate these changes? So if, if boards are making changes to the background experience and integrity of their key positions, key people in their organization that they oversee, they better have good reasons why, is the bottom line, for those changes. And they should be. If you're making changes in those kind of areas, there should be good logical reasons why you're doing so, and you should be able to, to explain that to the department. In directing senior management, especially today more than ever, a code of business conduct and ethics is critical. Probably as critical as it ever been in corporate America today. You know, Me Too movement has created probably a real focus on corporate leadership and ethics around corporate leadership. So who sets that? That's the board's responsibility, right? to set the kind of conduct they want to have with their employees from the CEO down and the ethics that they want to instill in this organization now and into the future. So the first question is, does the company have a code of, of business conduct and ethics? I don't know how any company, even the very smallest, can live today without a formal code of business conduct and ethics. You have exposed yourself, and I don't even want to get on that. I mean, there's a coverage guy here, Joel. He'll tell you, you don't got any of that and something happens, woof. You, you got a real big liability problem on your hand as an employer. I mean, the first thing, you know, in any of these kind of Me Too cases, sexual harassment, or et cetera, it's about what is the, where's your policy? It's the first thing Joel's gonna go in there. Where's your policy, your, your ethics code of conduct policy? Oh, I don't have one, oof. Um, explain how it's consistent with pertinent laws, rules, or regulations, if any. In many cases, there's not a lot in that area, but again, a code of professional conduct and ethics should be drafted, in my personal opinion, with good outside counsel from a good employer, employment uh, lawyer uh, to develop, which something is not just good for the organization, but it's good for the protection of the board and its liability and its fiduciary uh, responsibilities. This is nothing to take lightly today. You look at how much dollars are going out 
on these cases to pay for not just, just the litigation, but to pay for the settlements is enormous. And they're getting companies because they just didn't have oversight on these people. They let them run wild. What did he, uh, he, Henry Wine say? Who was the? Uh, Weinstein. Weinstein, Henry Weinstein. <laughs> what was the problem there? He, again, all that it is about is concentration of power. And oversight is about breaking down concentration of power so that you don't have somebody like him running around without oversight doing the things he was doing. You allow concentration of power within an organization, it's a recipe for disaster. How does the code, how does the code of business conduct address proactive reporting of any illegal or unethical behavior? The next question Joel would ask as a litigator, where's your whistleblower policy? Uh, I don't have one. Well, how do your employees know when they see something, say something, as Amtrak says a thousand times in my head when I'm at the 30th Street station? How, where is the policy? Critical today. You, you, it's, these are things from an oversight standpoint, a board, it's a must on boards today to have a whistleblower policy in place and one that actually works and you can demonstrate that it has worked if it, it need to be, and it must have a procedure in place, it must have a third party that maybe takes the calls or the whatever. You must have some independence around whistleblower policies. But if you don't have one in place and nobody knows where to go, that just creates additional liability to the board and to the senior management of a company. And again, why are these things important? Because this goes to a reputational, major reputational hit to a company, an insurance company, that could create a solvency issue, by the way. When you have a reputational hit, it can really destroy a company in a hurry in this country, whether it's insurance or any other corporate entity. And we've seen it, haven't we? Yeah, over and over. So these are critical areas that you have documented. And again, don't make up stuff. But if you need to say mea culpa, I need to do it, you better do it. You better have a work stream as a board. You better be monitoring and deliver a good whistleblower policy or a good ethics and code of behavior policy in the future if you don't have one today. Um, evaluation of performance and compensation programs. Um, Probably the toughest thing, a couple of tough things here that boards must do, and that's evaluating first and foremost the CEO, right? So what's the process? Again, one of the things that came out of the meltdown, and why, but believe it or not, there's a lot of questions that the department wants answered here, because one of the things out of the meltdown was clear that compensation programs that were designed to have the CEO take a lot of risk and take unlimited risk in many cases to bring down companies, then were paid 100 or 200 million dollars in a severance package on the way out. Infuriated the masses in this country, infuriated me, and um, should have infuriated a lot of boards to relook at how their compensation stacks up against risk taking by its CEO. That's why there's a lot of questions in this whole area, because this was a major factor created the meltdown. So what are they asking for? What processes and practices are used to evaluate performance, compensation, and corrective action to ensure effective senior management? This is the oversight. This is dealing with, and again, if you don't have standards, how do you determine performance? And, and, and do you create standards each year and goals for your CEO and his, senior his or her senior staff. How is compensation then aligned with those performance goals and standards? And the hardest thing a board has to do, in many cases, the most difficult job with the most important job is do they need to take some kind of action? The CEO is not executing, he's not doing the job the hardest thing to do as a board is go face to face with the CEO 
and tell them what the issues are and whether you're going to do a corrective action plan or let the person go. That's the hardest thing a board does. But in my opinion, I've said this over and over again, the most important thing the board can do. Because if you have an out of control CEO is not executing on the board strategy, culture, et cetera, uh, the board's really exposing themselves for lack of fiduciary responsibility. And believe it or not, in most cases in this country, it just takes one person at the very top to bring down a company in a hurry. You've seen it over and over again, not just in the insurance industry, but across all industries in this country. <clears throat> You better think about how you do that performance each year, what kind of standards you set, what kind of goals you set, and how you align the compensation program, which goes in some more detail in these other questions. Uh, what are the general objectives of significant, significant compensation programs? So again, they're asking you how your compensation aligns with execution and your CEO's performance. Now, if you're not doing that, well, again, don't make up stuff, but rethink about whether or not the board, and remember, a lot of these questions need to be answered by the board itself, not just senior management. Senior management so they can prepare, but every board member should agree with every word that's sent off to the department. <laughs> What are the compensation programs designed to reward? Again, does it reward taking too much risk? Uh, or again, you can also compensate to uh, having the CEO take too little risk. And that's not good either because that doesn't push an organization forward. If a CEO believes he doesn't have the authority to take too much risk, well, that's a stagnant organization. So it's a balancing act always. What is the board's role in overseeing management compensation programs? How in each element determined and or calculated? So who's responsible and how is it done? Again, um, you need to fully disclose what you're doing. How are compensation programs related to both company and individual performances over time? especially a CEO. A CEO should have both individual as well as the greater good kind of goals for the corporation. And then that compensation should, should be aligned on how then those standards, goals, objectives are met each and every year. Somehow the program has to do that. And, and you should never really be doing compensation, in my opinion, on the board on the fly. I mean, this should really be a, even the smallest companies, at least with the CEO, a very structured, and that's why in many cases, boards set up separate compensation committees because there's a lot of work to be done to create all this and to have a good program in place and have an understanding with your CEO on what the expectations are for that person to deliver over the next year and how he's gonna be compensated if he does meet him or he doesn't, he or she. Does the compensation program include risk adjustment? If so, how do the adjustments incorporate at different levels? And again, you know, this goes to the whole concept of if you incorporate risk into the, your goals with your, with your CEO, um, again, how are they adjusted? How, how can you as a board make sure that it doesn't mean the CEO is taking on too much risk to try to meet the objectives of the organization and the board? Uh, does the compensation program give any clawback provision to recover awards or payments? This has really got a lot of traction. I'm not sure how many corporations have changed their policies, but this is the old adage that if you took a company down, can you claw back on what you owe that CEO as part of the severance package? Or does he get his 100 or 200 million like many did in the meltdown after they allowed companies to almost go under under their watch? Or have you structured it so that you can claw back, take back those severance benefits under certain parameters? And again, these things can get dicey and difficult. That's why good HR and good legal 
H, a good legal employment counsel is important in many of these cases. Uh, when you're dealing with a with the CEO and especially a clawback provision. Does the compensation program include any other risk-based incentives? Department wants to know what kind of risk you're telling the, the CEO to take and, and how you're monitoring it and how you're compensating. So again, they can evaluate whether or not they believe maybe you're allowing the CEO to take on too much risk so that he or she can get their uh, compensation package. Succession planning. I, I, I don't know. This is like the most important thing in the world for great companies that continue to be great is some formal succession plan of both the board, but here we're talking about succession plan of senior management. What is your succession plan for each of the C-suite positions? And it should really be formal today because if you're, if you're gonna be a sustainable organization for another 100 years, you better have a good plan in place for succession. And what is it? The department wants to know. And, you know, the survey had some interesting stuff in this area. Uh, I will say some good answers, but, <laughs> you know, uh, five out of 14 said they did not have a formal succession plan in place. Now, that's, again, low-hanging fruit. That's critical to an organization. And whether you think you have one, and you can explain it's informal, again, but at some point you probably should consider formalizing your succession plan. Um, directing senior management, are there policies in place? Uh, three out of 14 said no, no policies are in place on how the board should be directing senior management. Um, 11 did out of 14, which is good. But again, you may do this informally, and that's how you should document your CGAT again, as we talked about. Uh, do you have a code of conduct? Well, good news here, 13 of 14 said we do. Uh, only one not, so hopefully that one's gonna be working on it. And the 13 said they, and it's documented. And obviously the one that doesn't have one doesn't have it documented, but that, I thought that was good news because that is critical today in my mind. Uh, I think we kind of went over the, uh, the, the NAMIC results were somewhat similar to the PAMIC results in, in, the, in these areas. Of, so. Steve, can I just hit on one thing? Sure. For, for those companies that do, said they do not have a succession plan, uh, here's an, uh, I don't know if it's a completely get out of jail free card, but it's, a, it's an easy response if you don't, and that is you do. What that succession plan is, it says you're going to create a succession plan. We're going to, you know, we might be engaging an outside consultant. We're going to be working with wherever you don't have something and you're responding to the CGAD, at a minimum, your response should be to tell the department, okay, I don't have this document on the shelf right now, but here are the steps I'm going to take over the next few months to get that in place. You don't ever, the answer, just in my mind, the answer in response can't be none. There's got to be something yeah. on there showing the department that you're focused on this, you're thinking about it, and you're going to be moving in the right direction. And again, you got to make it a work stream so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. <clears throat> so the results of your disclosure to me <clears throat> as a board is a good time to re evaluate, do you believe you have adequate controls in place over senior management? This is a really a good opportunity for a board to really assess whether they believe they have all the practices and procedures in place to monitor and control over the senior management. And do you believe you can improve your controls? Again, part of your answer could be we're gonna, we do believe we need to upgrade here. We are gonna upgrade and then you're gonna have to deliver on that. But it's an opportunity because governance is all about control, oversight and control. So if you believe as a board, once you start to do this kind of evaluation and, and assess it, you can improve your controls. Well, let the department say, yeah, we believe we can improve in this area and here's where we are and we're gonna have a work stream from the board to get this done. And I think that will be good answers and the, and the department will be more than glad to hear that you're doing stuff like that. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions or any comments of my panel members. So if you refer back to some of these items or address in your bylaws, what you mentioned is to be on those two, you have to provide some rationale. So is it good enough to say 
you know, that, that's documented in our bylaws or when you're answering these questions? Or well, if they're specific, but then I would draw out the, the actual language from the bylaws that you're referring to and, and make sure that it, it does address what they're requesting. But yes, the, there could be some stuff in your bylaws that would address governance issues that are there. And then you better say we're executing on that. Because again, so as I said, we said earlier, sometimes these bylaws get dusty on a shelf and you're not doing some of the stuff that's in your bylaws at meetings each, each and every time. And Eric, you can add uh, exhibits too. So you could just lift it out right. of your bylaws and attach it. So I think section F would be the exhibit. Good point. So when you're asking about succession planning, then do you have that? I mean, you're saying this view, you, but then do you ever, I mean, resharing their succession plan with this, this disclosure or would this say? Yeah, remember the disclosure is confidential. That's why it's confidential because some of this stuff is proprietary. So there's a there's confidentiality provisions within the statute. And you don't you don't necessarily have to copy it and say here it is. Right. But you want to be able to describe it sufficiently so that when the yeah, department looks at it, mm -hmm. they say, hey, okay, it's in place, I understand, it's reasonable, it makes sense for the size of the company. It, it, you're gonna to have to decide it might be easy enough just to say, here it is. And and you can rely on yeah. that confidentiality. Other companies might say, No, we're not we're not just gonna you know cut and paste it. Yeah, I agree on that succession plan document. Uh, that's more gray. I, I think you could you can say it's in place, it's effective as of such and such a date. We we have a, a copy is available upon request or something like that. Um, you, you could go either way. Is this an example where attaching the process or explaining the process is maybe more valuable than the actual outcome, so to speak? I don't think the department wants to know that Susie's going to take Billy's position when Correct. Billy retires. It's, it's here's the process that we have in place. Here's how this will work. Yes. In, in this process. Yes. Correct. And again, as Scott said, the template allows exhibits. So yes, and I agree that in succession, that's exactly what they're looking for. What was here on the bylaws that we haven't had a month that we should go back and make sure they get years. I think the BCL was up. Well, I, I, what I was talking about was the change of the BCL. I think it was three years ago, three somewhere years around there. That's Google. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I, I mean, if, in my perspective, from my perspective, if you're more than five, you're probably you're getting stale and dusty. Mm -hmm. It's worth a look. Yeah. Well, Scott, that's where he's going to take over, which I think is an error. Oh, one, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that among other things, keep it succinct. Uh, so if we're going to cut and paste, we're going to cut and paste as succinctly as possible. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very true. Very true. Uh, Scott is going to talk about the last area. And what my opinion is, almost all companies are probably a little lax on in this area and really do need to spend some time in its board to figure out how they're going to comply going forward Section E. Scott? It's narrow quarters back here. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't need any workers' comp claims. Though. Okay, thank you, uh, Scott Esworthy from Brown Schultz. Um, uh, th this section, I think it's interesting compared to the rest of the template. Uh, the rest of the template, the other presenters, it's it's uh, pretty much the presentation is spelling out the exact questions because there's a lot of questions for each of those sections. Uh, this section literally has three questions and, and it sort of leaves it to you in regards to identifying your critical risk areas and how, uh, how much you're gonna put in regards to narrative, a lot of gray, like we were just talking about with the last couple questions there within the Steve's presentation. Um, <laughs> So anyway, so, so what my presentation is, it's, it's, it's giving my opinions on some of the areas and likewise, maybe some ideas um, because there's a lot fewer specific questions in, in the template itself. So let's just go ahead a couple pages. So the first question in this section E, that's, this, that's the section we're referring to, is discussing how are the oversight management responsibilities delegated between the board committee and senior management. So um, this goes back to a lot of the topics and themes we've been talking about today, especially if you have senior management on the board, um, I, which is fine and that's very common, but I think you have to really make sure you, you, you put enough succinct 
uh, description in the CGAD to explain why that is and what are the roles and so forth. Um, so again, th this is definitely an area, the whole section E is probably very gray at a, compared to the others. Um, yeah, go ahead, Lisa. And I think this is a great area when you're looking at your governance and saying the board's role is this. What am I putting in that board package that's informing the board? What does it look like and how much do they need to know? And should they know? And what so that they're not diving into management or <coughs> all the detail, but the summary of the risks. You know, what what do they do in order to again to monitor that management's handling the risk of the organization and the risk of the strategic plan? And I think this is an area, too, where you um, really highlight your committee structure. You, you really talk about the committees you have in place um, and how those committees are addressing the critical risk areas uh, that, that you identify uh, for your company. Um, so I think this is definitely the section to really add quite a bit of narrative about your committee structure. And likewise, from a best practice standpoint, this is the area where you sort of put your thinking cap on, well, you know what, maybe there's an area here to improve our company and have one, or maybe we add some committees as well, if we think there's some voids after, as you're going through this process. Um, and you'll see, I'll touch upon IT a couple times here in, in my section. Um, Cybersecurity is coming down the pike. Ohio just approved it at the end of 18. Um, it's on the legislative agenda for 19 for Pennsylvania, so it will probably be approved in short order. Um, maybe not 19, but maybe 20, I would expect the latest. So, so some of our companies uh, that I work with have IT committees. They have CIOs. Um, this is an item, just to sort of go off on a tangent a little bit, uh, I've talked with a couple uh, folks during breaks and so forth, and we're talking about board transition and members leaving and things like that. Well, you know what? It might naturally evolve with cybersecurity coming down the pike because, especially if you have some older uh, uh, board members on the on the board, is this a risk that they want to be responsible for to oversee? It's getting very complicated. So, um, just just to mention that, uh, these are some at the bottom there, off to the. There's bullets to the right. I just put some some best practice uh, committees that some of our clients have. We don't see them at all clients, but the, uh, an actuarial committee uh, where the, the CFO, the actuary, and the head of claims gets together along with the chair of the audit committee. They meet a couple times a year and, and review the, the claims and review the reserves and talk about what's evolving, um, development, adverse, favorable, unfavorable. ERM, um, that's quite a few of you probably, I'm sure, have an ERM document or framework, um, but do you have a committee that actively evaluates it and, and rates the risks? Um, that's going to, in this area, if you do, if you are lucky enough to have that, um, which many of you might, that's, that's uh, the low-hanging fruit. That's an easy area to go to to work on this section E, because um, again, critical risk areas, it's going to match right up with, with ERM. Um, strategic planning, IT. The next, this is question two. So again, there's only three questions. So question two goes into, again, how is the board kept informed of the company's strategic plans, associated risks, steps senior management's taking to monitor and manage risk? Wow, that's, that's one question, but that's a, a lot to that, correct? So, um, so there, again, you just want to talk about your committee structure, talk about how your senior management identifies certain senior management uh, officers, your top leadership, what's their roles. Many of it's common sense and that you already have in place, have had it in place for years. But at the same time, again, sort of step back, maybe this is a time you evaluate um, what the CEO's role is and what they're responsible for presenting to and monitoring uh, for the board, and likewise for the CFO, C COO, CIO. Um, these are our, all operative areas to, um, to really detail and take a look at what each of those positions is responsible for and how do they interact with the committees that, that, uh, that they report to, and likewise, how does that flow up to the board? All right, so to be honest with you, those, the first two are the easy ones. All right, so, so the next one. Scott? Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick one. Yeah, sure. Um, when you talk about how the board's kept informed, 
I think we all know that throwing a bunch of big, scary reports at a, at a board isn't helpful. Uh, you put financial stuff and numbers in front of me, my eyes glaze over and I have no idea what's in there. But um, making sure that the, the reports that are provided are meaningful, are useful, are appropriate for, for board members as opposed to, you know, Steve might be able to look at financials in a very different way than I, but we're both on the board and it needs to be reported in a way that makes sense to us. <coughs> Just something to think about if you are looking at what those reports are, it's not just here's the big report from the auditor, read it and we'll talk about it. It's gotta be a meaningful, helpful report so the board can do its job. Yeah, that's a good point, Joel. As we, the third item is the key item with the critical risk area. So it says, what are the company's critical risk areas? That's the question, that, that's it. And then, and, it, and these items, these bullets, those are actually in the templates. So, so I didn't create those. That's what's in the template. Now you don't have to, these, and uses the word examples. Examples may include. So don't take this like, oh, I have to put something down for every one of those areas. Many of those areas are common, but th those are just defined as examples. So those are all the, the areas that are listed. What I think is interesting, IT isn't up there, but um, I think it should be. Um, as we go into the next page here, so, um, and I've heard this in different presentations through the uh, through the past year is, you know, uh, I think Steve said this long, many years ago at a PICPA, what keeps you up at night? You know, what keeps you up at night? What's your top 10 list? That That's your critical risk areas. And, and it's, 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 uh, it's not an area that um, you have to sit down, it's like, oh, we need to have a four hour meeting to figure out what our critical risk areas are. Many of you can probably rattle off five or six in your head in about 30 seconds. You, you, you know what they are. Now, now the tough part is, okay, well, how in depth do I go with each one and how much narrative do I put? Yeah, question. Yeah, I think that was just that our financial review um, towards the end, that was the exact question that was posed to me. What are the 10, like a 10? <laughs> and you're right, it was 10 things that keep you up at night that is exactly what these answers are. Mm, interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, so what we have here, again, I've touched on, have up here as a reminder, the ERM framework, again, try to leverage that. If you have that in place, that's that. And all uh, exhibits, we were talking about exhibits before. Um, again, you said, or use your own judgment. I mean, I think an exhibit of an agenda, um, maybe the, the ERM framework you have, you know, you can de determine how much you want to attach, but a, a picture goes a long way, you know, so if you can attach um, agendas from meetings, you know, I don't know if you want to go into minutes, but, um, you know, it, it might be ideal to, in certain areas, especially with this one, with critical risk areas, to maybe attach some exhibits of, from committee meetings, things like that. That's something to think about, just an idea. Um, so I listed up here uh, so, some, in my opinion, some common areas that I, I would think uh, we would see succession planning. And again, I was sort of thinking of PAMIC organization and, and the companies within PAMIC. Succession planning is big, big with the, the baby boomers retiring. I mean, it's, a, it's the smaller companies. I think it's a big item that a lot of folks are dealing with. Uh, loss reserves is sort of obvious. Cybersecurity, I just talked about. Um, that, that's one that you, people used to always ask me. So, so what is, uh, you know, if you're concerned, what's your biggest concern for an insurance company? It was always loss reserves, but then um, uh, number two was always much further down. Now I think cybersecurity is really coming up and being a very close second to loss reserves. Um, uh, IT systems, so that's one. We all know how, how expensive IT systems are to implement and put in place and, and the, the, the internal costs from, from your team to evaluate. Are you using an outside vendor? Are you trying to do internally, trying to keep up with your competitors too in this area? It's a, it's, it's a very time, a time intensive area. Uh, regulatory exams, I was at the spring meeting at PAMIC and, and that, that was one that the collective group uh, put up that, that was a critical risk area was dealing with the cost of regulatory exams and, and dealing with the compliance matters. Uh, uh, and reinsurance, obviously constantly trying to evaluate what's the right fit for your company and evaluating the cost. Um, again, business strategies to stay current, uh, to be competitive. Uh, threats to your distribution channel, so agencies. 
Um, maybe your agencies that you work with are expecting to see uh, different agency platforms and, and IT making their life easier to, to sell your business. Um, and then obviously the financial performance and strength of surplus is, is always an item that's discussed. Okay. All right, and then lastly, so related, it's, it's part of the third question, there's sort of sub-questions. Really, they're talking about, okay, well, of these that you list out, these top 10, what's the frequency you talk about it? Who, who's responsible for organizing this and presenting it to the boards and so forth? So again, the, the examples I've listed over the next couple pages is really what I would expect. And, and maybe you can, th these are just ideas when you're putting together your CGAG filing. But talk again, this is where you really hit the committees. You talk about the committees, because again, you, if you have an ERM committee, if you have um, finance committee, investment committee, um, talk about that, those committees, and talk about what, what is discussed at those committees for these critical risk areas. Um, who's in charge? Is the, is the CFO reporting um, to, to the chair? Or, or maybe there's a chair of the specific investment committee. Um, that's the type of dialogue. I don't think you have to go in for a page, but I think you have to have enough down there that a regulator um, or a user. At the end of the day, it's, we keep referring to regulators, but um, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was mentioned at a break that if uh, ultimately the board is responsible for this document, um, so heaven forbid if some litigation comes up as well, um, you know, what's in that document, uh, the board will be held to that. So we were talking about the succession planning, say, well, we don't have it, we're gonna put it in place the next couple months. Well, I would make sure you put it in place the next couple months. So be careful how you word uh, those types of items. You, you have anything on that, Joel? No, no, I, I think that's exactly Okay, all right. Yeah, so the next couple pages here, really is just touching on different examples that I've added. Again, these are some, if you do have, especially if you're dependent upon the size of your company and it almost doesn't matter anymore what size your company is, the IT implementation is extremely expensive. Um, many times this is a big nugget for most companies to manage and evaluate and, uh, and the resources you're bringing outside vendors. So again, dialogue related to that would, would sort of, I, I think, uh, would sort of be expected within the filing. Um, claim reserves, we talked about that, some different ideas, best practice related to some actual reserve committees. Um, and that's not, beyond, that's not that common, but I think it's a very good uh, best practice to use. Uh, and then next page, uh, sort of the obvious with, with CFOs, really, making sure, and, and sometimes with, I think with this process, what might come out of it is might be some adjusting of some of these roles. So, so you have the CFO presenting responsible for analysis and, and, and audit engagements, you know, presenting that, you know, sort of being the leader responsible to present that to your audit committees, your finance committees. Um, but likewise, regards to, let's say you have an exam that's ongoing. So at these, at these meetings that you have, you expect to get some regular updates. So how's the exam going? You know, what's, what's the latest related to that? That, that would be all fall under typically the CFO to discuss that. Uh, transition and top management. This is, uh, this is a big item ever, not only this industry, all industries are dealing with is with the baby boomer uh, uh, retirements and succession planning and who's involved in that. that. That's, again, that would be sort of an expectation I would think in this area is discuss uh, succession planning. And Steve touched on that on his presentation as well. And then lastly, just the, uh, the exhibit. Sort of, and again, use your own judgment what you want to attach, but that is part of the template. It's section F, the next section, um, to include. And there you go. Um, any questions on? Scott, I, yeah. I just wanted to, you were talking about the, um, the risk areas and the thing that I have been hearing a lot about lately mm -hmm. are these disruptors, mm. like uh, the insurance disruptors, like a lemonade. Right. For any of you who aren't, haven't paid attention to that, there are companies out there that, that think they can do it better. They think they can do it different, mm -hmm. substantially different than the way you're doing it today. And they think they can start because the millennials, I, I know that's a broad brush, but they think the millennials are different from the way we buy insurance. I have an agent, he's my best friend from high school, he's having, you know, that sort of thing. No, I want it here, I want to press this. Right. And, and these disruptors, they're not going away. They are getting big, they are well-funded, 
And their entire goal is to find a way to undermine the way you do business. So in my mind, I, I just hear I, I'm horrible at tech and I don't know if it's a sub part of the tech that right. you talked about, but but these insurance disruptors, if I was a CEO, I, I think that would probably be midway on that oh, list. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you're writing lines of business that these disruptors mm -hmm. are focused on, yeah. that would be something. I mean, that, that's where maybe goes back to staying competitive, you know, uh, in the environment and, and with your peers and so forth. Yeah. Um, I think it falls under that one. See? Yeah. And I, th these what I generally call emerging risks. And this is one thing that I think a lot of boards on medium and smaller companies probably don't do a good job of is is understanding what are some of the emerging risks out in the front of your window looking out that could really create havoc within your organization, like a lemonade or certain coverages. What, what's out there that's happening? Like who would ever thought talc could be, you know, where it's at today with the kind of uh, jury verdicts that are going against Johnson & Johnson. But these emerging risks really need for your organization, what are the emerging risks for your organization that you should be monitoring as a board on an ongoing basis to see what tr what is trending out there that could affect your business model? Or, like an auto writer only today. Well, you know, there's going to be a lot of change with you know driverless cars over the next 20 years. What's that mean to that organization's book of auto premium? That may drop dramatically. How are they, how's the organization in reacting to that emerging risk? Those kind of discussions, I know the department's always interested to know whether the board discusses things that are out in the future and how they could affect the company in the future and how are they going to continue to monitor and react at the appropriate time to those emerging risks. Ron? So, Steve, you brought up an interesting point. Um, and I want to just expand and see what your opinion is and maybe the audience opinion. So from where I sit and from the experiences I had and I know the experiences you've had as a regulator, I think an emerging risk is also apparent in the regulatory environment as well. A lot of our laws are outdated related to how uh, we underwrite, how we rate, how we do all kinds of things. Um, we have we have a lot, very little talent, experienced talent. There's some young talent, good talent, in the regulatory fields, in the regulatory departments. But it also then stifles a lot of creativity because there's right. not a lot of experience. Would it be appropriate, or do you think it's appropriate, that, that companies and boards identify that as an emerging risk as well? One of the things that sticks out to me is, is using analytics and, and to do rate making. And you know, the black box kind of rate making that right now we have laws passed in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s that prevent these kinds of things, but yet it's where we all know uh, the market can go. We know the pricing could be more <coughs> accurate to on an individual level um, and in many ways serve sort of consumer better. So I just want to get your, your feel for whether or not that's kind of emerging oh, yeah. is something you should be there. Because yeah. my mind's out, the regulators don't always hear it, um, but if they see this in writing, this is what we think of an industry. It's a concern. Now they have to sort of deal with it as well. So your report, you're saying your report to the regulator would tell you that your biggest concern is the regulator. Yeah, I know. Well, that won't make it. But yes, no, I mean, an emerging risk is changing of some laws and and some out there right now they call these sandbox legis pieces of legislation that allow under certain provisions companies to do things outside of the traditional insurance laws for you know this sandbox idea of trying a lemonade out and letting it do what it does in, in compliance which would be in compliance with the traditional underwriting claims, et cetera, non-renewal laws, et cetera. So these sandbox legislations are starting to catch on. You need to monitor that because if all of a sudden that comes into PA and they allow something like that, that could be a disruptor to your business model, allowing people to do things differently outside of the traditional framework we now have in place. So yes, it's definitely an emerging issue. 
And I'm not saying to complain to the okay? <laughs> yes? This section in particular uh, makes me think of Warsaw and Format. Right. And mm -hmm. you specifically talk about doing exhibits mm -hmm. in this section. Is it appropriate to make reference to that, to uh, attach it as an exhibit? A lot of people might not have had the opportunity to go through the Warsaw process, which is largely, you know, the emerging risk slash critical risk ranking process, which is great exercise for purposes of this. But it is duplicative in some cases, so I don't know how, how less is more. Well, uh, I, I, again, without reading, without reading the ORSA, it could or could not. The ORSA may be general enough just to talk about your processes. Remember, the CGAD is about what the board does. So if there's discussion in your, in your ORSA about boards and responsibilities over certain of these risk areas, yes, you can refer to or, so to speak, cut and paste, but I would certainly, if I cut and paste, would note that that is also in my ORSA. But remember, there's not many ORSA filers in PA. I think there's like 18 or 19 filers of ORSAs compared to a total of 265 that are going to have to file the CGAT. But yes, but remember again, the, the ORSA has to talk about the board because that's what this is all about. I like your comment of having had the opportunity to do ORSA. I have no clients that would agree with how that was said. It's more of the, the misfortune. But I think, you know, Steve, you mentioned it in your presentations. It's a good thing to read what those requirements are. And although that is the complete, you know, Learjet um, for the for a lot of entities is to look at it kind of how what the perspective is on risk management. But like you said, it's you know the the corporate disclosure, what you're doing in your governance structure on enterprise risk and how you're addressing it, you know, to focus on it. And I'm I'm a big fan of reference something as opposed to providing a lot of copies. Um, you know, and attaching mm -hmm. it, you know, as well. But the one thing you want to be and make sure that you are and you'll get caught if you're not, is you got to be consistent. Yeah. Uh -huh. Don't true. change the wording. <laughs> That's yeah. true. Any other questions from the, from the group? Very good. Uh,